Hello, my name is Ricky, and welcome back for another Fat Electrician Reaction. This one was suggested uh, quite a few times, even though it actually came out just three days ago. And it actually got me, it got my attention real bad, because it feels like a, a war movie, or just like a fake story about the Barbary Wars. But that's actually a thing, and I want to learn more about it. Uh, I think, if I'm not completely mistaken, either was the uh, the Navy or actually the Marines that got uh, created by George Washington. I'm going to say George Washington. I'm not really sure. For the only purpose to kick the crap out of the Barbaries or the Barbary nations. We got 24 minutes here with that electrician explaining it to us. Uh, and that's going to be just a wonderful 24 minutes in my book. If you haven't checked out the Fat Electrician, uh, links for the video we're going to watch, and of course for the channel, is available in the description. Go there and give them the support that they so much deserve. And welcome to Sweden. As you can see, we have a quite a sunny day today. And uh, it's November. I'm pretty happy there's sun. So. Back off. Before you watch, if you do enjoy the content, don't forget to smack the like and, of course, hit that subscribe. I would greatly appreciate that. Two small things. Huge for me. Consider it. And, of course, we say thank you so much to the channel members and the patrons. Thank you so much for the incredible support. A big shout-out to the Supreme Tier donors over by Patreon and, of course, on channel membership. Personal shout-outs to the Ultimate Supporters, Deja Walt, Ronnie Dwayne, Kevin Dana Troy, Sarah, Robert, Matt, Tracy, Lon, and Barbara. Lon and Barbara. There you go. Thank you. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Now, let's find out how the U.S. Navy, I think, kicked the shit of the Barbaries or the Barbary nations. Ah, yes, that time that pirates kept messing with American ships, so George Washington founded oh. the United States Navy, Navy to do something about it. Yeah, the United States Navy was... I thought it was uh, that or Marines. So either the Navy or Marines. But he said the Navy, and I'm, I'm going to go with that, of course. He knows way more than I do. ...founded for the sole reason of hunting pirates. <laughs> Today we're talking about the Barbary Wars. Ladies and gentlemen, it is pretty much an ongoing internet joke that you do not mess with America's boats. You know, because of Operation Praying Mantis, that time that America decided they were going to sink half of Iran's Navy in yeah. like eight hours. Yes, yes, and, yes. And Vietnam, and and World War II, and World War One, and the Spanish-American War, and the War of 1812. Um, I guess if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you, this is the origin story of why you don't mess with America's boats. But first, we're actually going all the way back to how it all started. George Washington building up a big ass Navy for the sole purpose to kick the crap out of the Barbary nations. So we're actually gonna go back and take a look on how it all started. The root, the start, the, the beginning of the kicking of F. <laughs> work from our sponsor because this video is brought to you by my favorite underwear company sheath wait hold on i'm supposed to read a script for this one here's how to do a perfect ad read for our company let's take a quick second to thank our favorite sponsor for today's show which is sheath underwear sheath makes the most comfortable boxer briefs ever worn and clarence parents have a real good marriage this shit's fucking lame okay look here's the deal whether you're talking to a veteran a construction worker or your dad they're all going to tell you that there's one universal truth to life and that truth is that cargo pockets are fucking awesome God damn right. If you think cargo shorts are cool, wait till you try cargo underwear, except the cargo pocket is made with balls not being stuck to your thigh technology. And I know oh. what you're thinking, but chubby electron guy, what if I try them out and I don't like it? Cool, just wear them like normal underwear and then you have a bonus cargo pocket. Nobody in the history of mankind has ever been like, damn it, I have too many available cargo pockets. It's never happened. Cargo shorts are not even cute at all. First of all, cargo shorts are awesome. They always have been. Second of all, you know what you and this cargo pocket have in common? You don't feel either of us? Oh my days, that's a burn. Ah. Oh, that was brutal. <laughs> 
Well, Married. at least I know who I'm not letting put their phone in my pocket next time we go somewhere. Anyways, if you wanted to try some sheath cargo underwear Ooh. for yourself or buy some as a gift for your significant other, I'll have them linked in the description down below. And you can use the discount code <laughs> FATELECTRICIAN for 20% off. Back to the video. All right, here's the deal. For three centuries, pirates from the Barbary states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli. Okay. So we got states. The Barbary states, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Tripoli. I didn't know that. I thought it was just like Tunisia and Tripoli. Now here we go. We got one, two, three, four, four different states and a bunch of. Oh, look at that. We can actually see the map here. Uh, I hope you guys can see, of course. Uh, it's a reddish color here. This is where they roamed during their raids. Oh, look at that. South, all the way up to Portugal, Spain. Uh, this is Gibraltar. And I think that's like a Morocco, no, uh, Mallorca and stuff like that right over here, Tenerife. And that's pretty brutal because it's going all the way up to more or less the coast of uh, Italy too. I didn't know that. I thought they like a bunch of bitches running around just right here or at the strait would raid merchant vessels in the Mediterranean, steal all the goods, and imprison and turn all of the crew members into slaves. So why was this allowed to go on for over 300 years? Well, the only Navy Damn. powerful enough to stop these pirates at the time were the Spanish, the French, and the British. And they all came to the same conclusion that it would be cheaper to pay off the pirates, giving them a yearly tribute to not raid their ships rather than go oh. to war with them. So now those three empires aren't getting their ships raided, which is fine, that's a good thing, I guess, but here's the catch with it that they may or may not have known at the time, but they definitely figured out somewhere along the way. Now, the pirates are only raiding all the smaller nations, okay? It's like Walmart, Target, and Amazon getting together, encouraging shoplifting, knowing that they can shoulder the financial burden, but it puts all the other mom and pop stores out of business and they become the only ones selling goods. Except instead of retail stores, we're talking about entire nations. This goes on for literally hundreds of years, but America is still part of the British Empire, so they fall under their umbrella of protection, so it's never an issue. That is until the American Revolution started on April 19th, 1775 okay. with the shot heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and the famous story of a 78-year-old veteran going out into his front yard and shooting three redcoats as they retreated back to Boston, sending the message for all of America that the... I just saw that movie, The Patriot. <laughs> this film is 20 years old. 23 years old, like, what the hell? Yeah, we're getting old, buddy. Just accept it. Deal with it. Adapt or die. British Empire should get off of our lawn. Fast forward, 1783, America wins the Revolutionary War, officially becoming its own country, and all of America's merchant vessels start flying the old red, white, and blue. And pretty much immediately, 1784, one of America's merchant vessels is captured by Barbary pirates from the country of Morocco. As an act of good faith for a new nation, Spain actually pays off the pirates, gets the American vessel and all of its crew back, returns it to America, and then advises the American government, hey, you guys should start paying these guys off too. That's what all the big nations are doing. And here comes the difference between all other nations. Because like he said, we got Spain, we got France, and we got um, England or UK. We're actually paying off the pirates not to attack them. Uh, and I think it's like quite a substantial amount of money to, not net, you know, to protect their goods. Now comes the difference between America and everyone else. We don't pay people off. We just murder them. I think it's a good deal, to be honest. At which point, America's minister to France, a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson, chimes in and he's like, no, absolutely not. I'm going to go talk to him. Now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically, Thomas Jefferson rolls up and he's like, hey, don't ever fuck with my boats ever again or else. At which point, the Sultan of Morocco is like, I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America. You know, we just kicked the British out of our entire country. We're our own thing now. I'm sorry, you fucking pilgrims did what now? We beat the British in war and now we are our own country. You mean to tell me that a bunch of colonial farmers with muskets went toe to toe with the largest military on the planet <laughs> that is so red good coats. at war that they can literally wear high vis red coats the entire time and still win and you beat them. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. 
I mean, yeah, I could probably just leave your boats alone from now on. That historically seems like it's going to be a really good idea. And that is the story of how Morocco came to be the first country to recognize America as its own sovereign nation by signing the Moroccan American Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which is the first and longest lasting peace treaty in American history. That is completely mind blowing. I did not know that. So the actually, did he actually go to Morocco and told the Sultan like, back off and he said cool i'm gonna sign a paper that makes us best friends forever bffs shit you learn on youtube is just mind-blowing isn't it at which point thomas jefferson is like wow that actually worked out perfect i'm gonna go to the other three barbary states and tell them the same thing now but of course there's gonna be a catch with that you see there's four barbary states but morocco is the only one that's actually truly independent and the other three are just subservient branches of the Ottoman Empire. So Thomas Jefferson and John Adams go to talk to the ambassador. So basically the Ottoman Empire were, if you, don't, if you didn't know about Ottoman Empire, they were freaking huge. I'm telling you, I'm telling you all the way from freaking Africa, all the way down Southeast was basically freaking Ottoman Empire, huge empire of Tripoli and they're like hey can all the Ottoman Barbary states leave our boats alone at which point the ambassador informs them absolutely not you see we're part of the Ottoman Empire we don't need to listen to you we're not scared of you guys and it is our official stance that and I quote it was written in the Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners who it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave you know unless they give us money of course everything's got a price apparently so Thomas yeah. Jefferson is like well okay we're going to war then and that's when John Adams is like whoa 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 calm down let's just pay the tribute so that our ships can be fine we already disbanded the continental navy after winning the revolutionary war we don't have a navy to fight these guys we just have to give them the money so that's what happened for the next eight to ten years america would pay tribute every year to these three remaining barbary states and every year they wanted more and more money and eventually even that wasn't enough because algiers began attacking american vessels anyways okay if you're not picking up what i'm putting down i'm trying to tell you that for the first time in american history somebody has fucked with one of america's boats and they're not immediately sorry about it Yep. Yet. The president at the time, George Washington, goes to Congress and pretty much tells them what's going to happen because at this point in time, George Washington is basically the king of America. Nobody actually knows if he's going to step down from presidency or not. So he's like, hey, guess what? You guys are going to pass the Naval Act of 1794, oh, establishing the United States Navy. And at the very top of that document, it very clearly states that the purpose we are building the United States Navy is so that we can combat Algerine Corsairs, which is just a fancy word for state-funded <laughs> pirates. Yeah. Yes, I'm telling you that the founding document of the most powerful Navy the world has ever seen at the top specifically states the sole reason for their creation is to hunt down and destroy pirates that had the audacity to fuck with one of america's ships one thing i always think about when they talk about history we got a situation and there was a reaction to the situation which is the united states navy what would happen if the barbary states was paid off forever would probably probably i'm saying i'm pretty 98 percent sure that there would be a navy anyway i love history we have officially entered the find out portion of the story america immediately commissions the building of six enormous frigates covered in guns to go fight these pirates fast forward to when the frigates are done it takes oh, a couple shit. years it is now 1798 and george washington has decided to step down from power allowing for an election to happen and we are now into the second president of america john adams and john adams decides he would rather keep paying tribute. Disappointed! America just created the Navy, spent a million dollars creating all these frigates, and now John Adams isn't going to use them for their intended purpose. Obviously, a lot of people are upset, including his own vice president, Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson, the vice president at the time, immediately begins campaigning to run against the sitting president in the next election. And one of his biggest platforms is that he is going to go fight these pirates rather than pay them tribute. And his slogan for this is, and I quote, millions in defense before a cent in tribute. Okay, just so we're clear, Thomas Jefferson's... Whoa. I actually gave me goosebumps. Millions in defense before sent in a tribute let that linger a bit 
Oh, it's a, mm, it's a tasty caramel. Platform for running for president is I'm going to spend millions of dollars in defense, which might as well be hundreds of billions of dollars at that point, because America no longer negotiates with terrorists. And I'm pretty sure my high school English teacher would refer to this as foreshadowing. So Thomas Jefferson wins the election. The entire world finds out that he's going to be the third president of the United States of America. And then on March 4th, 1801, the day of his inauguration, he receives a letter from Yusuf Karmanali, the Pasha of Tripoli. If you don't know, Pasha is like the dictator, the king, the president, the, the main yeah. dude in charge. And at this point, Thomas Jefferson, the guy who just ran an entire presidential campaign on well, I'm going to go fight pirates, <laughs> is thinking in his head like maybe this guy found out that I'm about to send a Navy over there to beat him up and he's going to send an apology. Maybe he wants to sign a peace treaty like Morocco did. This is already working out great. I don't I think so. I might not even have to send my I don't think so. over there. He opens the letter and Pasha Yusuf Karmanali has decided that he is going to poke the Pilgrim King because he is now demanding that because of the new administration, the United States owes him an extra $225,000 in tribute. And Thomas Jefferson is pissed. You're trying to get crazy with us, eh? Don't you know I'm local? Originally, Thomas Jefferson was going to have to go to Congress, get permission to activate the Navy, to send him over there to fight these pirates, but not now. He's so mad, we're activating the rainbow shortcut to ass whooping land, and Pasha Yusuf is going to have some consequences immediately because he's sending the Navy today. But like I said, it takes a literal act of Congress to send the U.S. Navy over there on a military mission, so Thomas Jefferson is like, that's fine, we just won't send him on a military mission. Fill up one of our frigates with a bunch of gifts and peace offerings for Pasha Yusuf, and then give it a nice healthy escort of other frigates to defend it and send them on their merry way to and that's how you fake it like what are you talking about we ain't going to war no we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh we're gonna pay him and there's gonna be sh ships guarding the the uh the payment there's no war <laughs> to deliver the gifts. Right after he gives the commander of the United States Navy the standing order that he is also to defend any American citizen or ship from any potential aggression. Not aggression, potential aggression. If he thinks that somebody else might be thinking yeah. about doing something aggressive. And we're all talking about it could be like a stare, like a glance, like, oh, he's looking at me, kill him. Take him out, take him down, do your... Your so the Navy sets sail. They're gone. They're in route. Thomas Jefferson's sitting in his office and he comes to the realization, man, I'm pretty sure these pirates are going to attack him. But if they don't, they're actually going to end up giving Pasha what's his nuts a bunch of these gifts. And I can't have it. So he whips out the old quill and parchment. He writes a letter back and sends that off. And that letter basically reads, hey, America's done giving you tribute for the rest of forever. F off. And obviously the letter makes it there first, at which point Pasha goes to the American consulate building and chops down the flagpole with the American flag on it, which in that part of the world is how you declare war. So the U.S. Navy shows up off the coast of the Barbary States. The pirates attack them because they've already declared war. The U.S. Navy defends themselves. Word gets back to America. Congress then is like, oh, hey, we're at war. We're going to go ahead and give Thomas Jefferson permission to use the United States Marine Corps at his discretion. And this is why to this day, the United States Marine Corps is the only branch of the US military that can be sent and deployed anywhere in the world without congressional approval. So for the next two years, the US Navy- Hey, oh, I didn't know that. So they, wow, wow. You, you cannot send the Navy without a congressional approval. So the entire Congress needs to be on 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 point on game with this however you can actually send the marines without any kind of improvement from the congress i need know that why though Navy and the Marine Corps set up a naval blockade and just go on a pirate hunting extravaganza until October of 1803 when the USS Philadelphia would get hung up on an uncharted reef right off the coast of Tripoli. The pirates yeah. seize this opportunity. They attack the USS Philadelphia, board it, take the crew hostage, and then over the next couple months, they were able to repair it enough to get it back into the harbor at Tripoli where they then anchored it in place and used it as fixed artillery because it had way more guns than any other vessel they had. Cue our first main character, Steve. 
Stephen Decatur, the commander of the USS Enterprise, America's unofficial flagship. He decides that he's going to don his plot armor, take the USS Enterprise out, and acquire himself a pirate ship, which he does. He then takes that pirate ship and the USS Enterprise and sails both of them to Sicily, where he hires five Sicilian mercenaries that know how to speak Arabic. They then sail back to Tripoli, where Decatur and 80 Marines are going to go below deck of this pirate ship, which has now been christened the USS Intrepid, as the five mercenaries are going to sail directly into the heart of the harbor, pretending to be Barbary pirates. They then go directly to the USS Philadelphia, 80 Marines and Stephen Decatur run out, kill the entire crew of pirates that are on the USS Philadelphia, and reclaim it. Unfortunately, the USS Philadelphia is too damaged to actually be used as a ship ever again. Sink it. At which point, Stephen Decatur decides, fine, we're just going to burn the entire thing to the ground because if we can't have it, nobody can. Deprive the enemy. That makes completely sense. Like he said, the Philadelphia has a bunch of guns and better guns than any of the Barbary Nation's ships. Makes completely sense. I would do that too. Yeah, Ricky. Sure. We have nice things. I'm pretty sure Sun Tzu said that. So that's exactly what they do. They light the USS Philadelphia on fire. They're positive it can't be put out. And then they bounce. Not a single American is injured. And Stephen Decatur is hailed a hero because he has now led what is, in my opinion, America's first special operations mission. So now that that's Oh, taken care of, that gave me some goosebumps. That's how it all started. We're going back, people. The problem at hand is that the crew of the USS Philadelphia is still being held hostage by the Barbary pirates, and they want a ton of money in exchange for them back however america no longer negotiates with terrorists and that's not an option cue our next two main characters william eaton and presley o'bannon and before you ask yes presley o'bannon as in the uss o'bannon the fletcher class destroyer from world war ii that sank a japanese submarine with potatoes so they go in and they pitch their idea of how they're going to get the crew of the u.s did you say potatoes i saw there was a link potatoes i've heard about the o'bannon Nothing about the pota potatoes, though. SS Philadelphia back, and it is, by every definition, a special operations mission. Basically, they want to take themselves, two dudes, plus six Marines for a total of eight guys, and they're going to get dropped off in Egypt, because in Egypt is Yusuf Karmali's brother that is living in exile because Yusuf kicked him out because he is technically the rightful heir of Tripoli. So they're going to get that guy and all the buddies that are loyal to him, like 500 men, and then they're going to march them through the desert to Derna, where they are then going to use them to fight and take over the city and exchange the city for the crew of the USS Philadelphia. And upon hearing this ridiculous plan, the US military leadership is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want to take a small contingency of men, be dropped off in a foreign country, meet up with a rebel leader who already has a bunch of men, and then convince him that you're going to help him overthrow a current dictator, and then he can be the new dictator, and basically we're using other people to fight other people that we don't like to benefit us? And Presley O'Bannon and Eaton are like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much exactly it. And the government is like, this is a terrific idea. I mean, we're probably never, ever going to do anything like this ever again. And we're not going to have an entire branch of special forces that specializes in it. Sorry, anyways. No, definitely not. No, that makes no sense. Really, no sense whatsoever. First time. First time in the last time. That's exactly what they do. They get dropped off in Egypt. They track down Hamet. They're like, hey, you want to go overthrow your brother? Cool. Grab your guys. Let's go. Somewhere along the way, the Marines also picked up 50 Greek mercenaries as they all began marching 500 miles through the Libyan desert to get back to the Tripolitan coast. And this march through the desert takes 50 days and it is a complete shit show because somewhere along the way, they start running low on supplies and they have to start rationing. And then some people get mad. There's accusations because the Greek guys are Christian. Hamet guys are Muslims, there's fighting amongst themselves, and there's these eight Marines standing in the middle desperately trying to keep them from killing each other as they march through the desert. So despite multiple mutiny attempts and a ton of fights, the Marines were able to keep this group together enough to make it through the Libyan desert till they arrived at the coastal wow. city of Bomba. Once they get there, they meet up with the USS Argus that gives them a bunch of supplies so they can start eating food again, and they give enough money to pay off the Greek mercenaries. Then, Eaton decides that he's going to send a letter over to the governor of Derna right next door. Because remember, we can't attack unless they're potentially aggressive. Okay, so he sends a letter and is basically yeah. like, hey, I'm going to march my army through the middle of your town to go kill your boss on my way to Tripoli. Um, can I have some safe passage and maybe some food? The governor of Derna sends a letter back that says, my head or yours, which sounds 
potentially yeah, that's dangerous that's dangerous yeah i would i would take that as uh, a threat and yeah yeah that makes sense plan for the ground attack hamet and his men are going to take the governor's palace and the marines and the greek mercenaries are going to take out the harbor fortress but to do that they're going to need a cannon from the uss argus so they're going to meet up with it go get this cannon and prepare for their attack Cut back to Stephen Decatur. While all this has been happening, there's still been a naval battle in the Mediterranean the entire time, and Stephen Decatur is on an absolute rampage, because after he captured his first pirate ship, he would receive word that his brother, James Decatur, had been mortally wounded by one of the pirate ship's captains, who was pretending to surrender before shooting his younger brother. Upon hearing this, Decatur immediately gives command of the new captured vessel to one of his men, leaves a couple guys with him, and takes off to track down this pirate ship that just killed his brother. So they they chase down this pirate ship they pull up right next to it and before the crew has time to do any shit. procedures you know like break out the planks tie some ropes to the other ship all yep, the stuff yep. you see in the movies nah Stephen Decatur jumps into the enemy ship and starts killing pirates immediately. Nine Marines seeing that happen are like, oh shit, we're doing this. So they jump onto the pirate ship too and start throwing down, at which point the pirate ship veers off and breaks away from Decatur's ship. It is now nine Marines and Stephen Decatur versus over 30 pirates on this vessel and 30 is not going to be enough. Stephen Decatur kills multiple pirates, including the captain that had slain his brother, officially avenging his brother's death capturing that vessel as well but he is still absolutely furious that his brother died and he continues to go on a rampage capturing another pirate ship and destroying three more over the coming weeks cut back to the men on the ground eaton and O'Bannon have been getting their battle plan ready this entire time they just had their men go get a cannon oh wow <clears throat> revenge yeah that's how you revenge like what 100 people for his brother off the USS Argus because they really, really need this cannon if they're going to be able to pull off this mission. So they're ready to attack. The US Navy gets into formation and they are going to bombard the entire city of Derna while they launch this attack. Despite that, there's over 2,000 men loyal to Pasha Yusuf that are going to defend it and they are heavily outnumbered. So Navy starts bombarding the shore. Hamet and his men take off to go attack the governor's palace and Eaton, O'Bannon, the Marines, and the Greek mercenaries begin launching their attack on the harbor fortress. They open up with the initial cannon fire, which is going to be vital to be able to break through the enemy lines and establish their foothold. They fire the cannon. As they go to reload and fire it again, they realize that they had accidentally forgot to take the ramrod out of the cannon and shot that at the enemy too. Now the cannon's completely out and they're kind of like, oh shit, what do we do? What do we do? And Presley O'Bannon just charges into battle as the other Marines follow behind him and the Greek mercenaries behind them. They attack so quickly and so violently that they're able to overrun the entire enemy fortress before anybody really knows what's going on. And Presley O'Bannon becomes the first American ever to raise the Star Spangled Banner over a foreign battlefield. This battle, the taking of the Tripolitan Coastal... So many epic moments in this story. Dear. Oh, I'm going to let that sink in for a bit. First time, first time someone back then raised the flag, Star Spangled Banner, on a foreign soil. Whew city of Derna is enshrined in Marine Corps history in the Marine Corps hymn with the line from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli and it is also where the Marine Corps would get their first nickname ever because the seven Marines present for this battle fought so hard and so violently that they simply became known as the Leathernecks referring to the leather collar that they wore around their neck to protect it from slashes from pirate swords. So Yusuf's men end up getting beaten back and are forced to retreat to Tripoli at which point the Marines, the Greeks, and Hamet and his men all consolidate, figure out what happened. Hamet and his men were able to take over the governor's palace, and after the taking of the city of Derna, Hamet awards his very own sword to Presley O'Bannon as a gift for oh. how valiantly he fought in battle. And this is the Mameluke sword, the same sword that is on the Marine Corps uniform today. So now Yusuf consolidates his military, oh. sends an enormous army back to Derna to try to take it back over, and they're kind of just sitting on the outskirts of the city, waiting for the right moment to attack. Eaton and 
Neil Bannon are writing correspondence to the US military in the chain of command like hey we took this entire city with like eight Marines give us some reinforcements we're gonna go take Tripoli next and then we'll just overthrow this entire country this goes on for over a month and they defend the city multiple times from attacks from Yusuf's men and eventually Eaton receives a letter informing him that he is to stand down and just leave because American diplomat Tobias Locke has struck up a deal with Yusuf Karmanali. And apparently he struck up this deal with absolutely nobody's permission because the deal is America is gonna pay Yusuf Karmanali, the pirate king, $60,000 and in exchange, we are gonna receive the USS Philadelphia back as well as a peace treaty that they are gonna leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's pretty pissed off about it from Thomas Jefferson, Presley O'Bannon, William Eaton, Stephen Decatur. They're all furious that we are now giving $60,000 to this pirate king as opposed to overthrowing his entire city of Tripoli or at a minimum using the fact that they're holding Derna and use that as leverage to exchange. But whatever, the war's over, I guess. For now. So the peace treaties were signed in 1805. Now, fast forward seven years, 1812, the War of 1812 happens. Okay, if you don't know, the War of 1812, there's more to it than this, but the reason that it started is that Great Britain wanted to have more control over the seas and trade because America was getting too much because America was no longer getting attacked by pirates because we just beat them in a war now too. So, Great Britain launches another war against America. During this war, they encourage the Barbary pirates to start attacking American vessels again. And honestly, it works out pretty good for the pirates, at least for a little while, because the American Navy is too busy to worry about them because their hands are full with the British Navy. Fast forward two years, eight months later, the- Can you picture the amount of ships that the, the Royal Navy, uh, the British had back then? They were the strongest Navy forces in the world back then. War of 1812 ends. Now, luckily for the Barbary pirates, Thomas Jefferson is no longer president at this point. We are on to America's fourth president. Let me check my notes here. Um, James Madison. If you don't know, James Madison is one half of what is referred to as the forefathers dynamic duo. And the other half is his best friend of all time, Thomas Jefferson. And I don't know if you figured this out yet at this point in the story, but Thomas Jefferson hates pirates. So sitting president James yeah. Madison being the homie that he is looks over at now Commodore Stephen Decatur and says, go get him tiger. He then proceeds to assemble the largest U.S. naval fleet ever at this point in time and sails directly to the Barbary Coast. He then immediately tracks down Algiers' flagship, the Mashuda, takes it out, captures over 400 members of its crew and the ship itself. He then proceeds to take all of his gunboats directly to Algiers, park them in the port and say, here's the deal. You're going to surrender and you're never going to collect tribute from anyone ever again, or I'm going to overthrow your entire country. Obviously they take the first option, at which point Decatur's like, okay, makes sense. Cool, next order of business. You're also going to pay me back for all the U.S. merchandise that you plundered during the war of 1812. And they're like, okay, here you go. They give it to him. He then proceeds to sail his fleet next door to Tunis and tell them the exact same thing, ordering them to sign a peace treaty, never raid an American vessel again, and then collects a bunch of money. He then sails them next door again to Tripoli and does the exact same thing, collects all this money, gets the peace treaties. The Barbary pirates never mess with America ever again. Decatur and his fleet sail back home and he tells the government what happened. The American government is blown away at the results that Decatur was able to achieve when asked how he managed to not only get peace treaties without too much violence, but also get a bunch of money and concessions on top of it. All Decatur said was peace was achieved through the mouth of our cannons, at which point he was given the nickname the conqueror of the Barbary pirates. And with the rest of the world seeing a new country in its infancy stand up for itself against the Barbary pirates and winning, they would start doing it too. And everybody started fighting back and quit paying tribute to the Barbary pirates. And in the coming years, they would fade into nothing as their 300 year reign of terror had come to an end. So in conclusion, the moral of the story is please, for the love of God, do not mess with America's boats. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. Oh, again, again, we're talking about uh, <clears throat> some history that cannot be explained in in the sense of that he does. I mean, he is pretty much the champion 
of grabbing the interest and pulling out my complete full attention every time in every video. I am completely in love with this channel, uh, Fat Electrician. If you haven't checked it out yet, please do. Uh, you find the link for both the video we just watched and, of course, uh, the, uh, for the channel. Go there and give them the support that they so much deserve. I don't know how to wrap this up, but I'm going to think about it for a very long time because this is the cradle of civilization, the cradle of U.S. Navy, the cradle. Let that sink in for a bit. If you did enjoy the content you currently watch, don't forget to smack the like and, of course, hit that subscribe and let me know. Next one I should react to. Other than that, Thank you so much for watching. I'm Reiki. You stay safe.